Okay. Um, so welcome to the first in the GFTU Trade Union Working Class History Sessions. Uh, my name is Gwaine Little, uh, General Secretary of the General Federation of Trade Unions, and really, really pleased to open up these sessions and welcome you. Um, as you'll hopefully know, having signed up, this is a series of sessions running uh, at 7pm on the third Tuesday of every month. We'll be running throughout the year, so 12 sessions in total. And we've got some really interesting things coming up um, this evening. We'll be talking about 1549 uh, and everything associated with that. We can discuss whether revolts, rebellions or revolutions of 1549 uh, will be part of our discussion this evening. Um, next week's session, we'll be looking at the level. Of, sorry, next month's session, looking at the levelers uh, and then on to uh, industrial unrest from 1910 to 1914 and many other interesting sessions throughout the year. They're not in strictly chronological order. What we've done is we've gone to uh, a range of uh, interesting and expert presenters on, on the topics that they wanted to share with us and that we wanted to hear about. Um, so it's a, a bit of a mix and a, a chance to um, have some interesting input, but also to engage in uh, discussion amongst ourselves. I think understanding working class history is so important for building both the present, but most importantly, the future of our movement. So it's in that vein um, that we've put these sessions together. And I am really, really pleased to welcome uh, the presenter for our first session. Uh, my predecessor, Doug Nichols, was General Secretary of the General Federation of Trade Unions, and before that, the Community and Youth Workers Union. Um, he has a strong interest in labour and working class history and in this particular period. So I know we're in for a bit of a treat this evening. I hope that the fact he can't hear us um, won't cause any problems in terms of coordination or communication. Um, but I'm just going to type in the chat now to let him know that I've introduced him and he may begin. So, um, as I say, welcome and uh, over to Doug. I'm OK to begin. And uh, maybe uh, if you could put start with the first slide up there, I can um, come to that in a minute. OK, well, um, thanks, everyone, for joining us. It's good to see so many people. Um, um, Gawain and I have uh, similar uh, thoughts on things, and I haven't been able to hear what he's just said, so I hope I don't uh, repeat anything by way of introduction. But um, we're committed at the GFTU to uh, keeping history alive. Um, and we also believe that um, in discussing uh, things as long ago as this, 474 years, that uh, there are things that are still of great significance and relevance to us. And uh, we also believe at the GFTU that you can't really know where you're going unless you know where you come from uh, as a movement. And one of the sad things has been, of course, that um, history, the history of our struggles and of our class, has been removed from most trade union education programmes. Indeed, it's gone from most school curriculums and it's gone uh, from university history departments as well. So we're doing pretty important stuff, I think, at the GFTU in trying to keep this history live, which was once fairly common knowledge uh, amongst trade unionists uh, who would go on courses to look at some um, various elements of our history. Um, you may know that we've done a book at the GFTU, um, which is a, a graphic novel giving the history of uh, the country from our perspective. And um, I hope that people may ha have a look at uh, uh, that one day and uh, uh, thinking of Christmas gifts for people. But it's tried to present our history in a, a popular format. Um, very often the history of our country and our struggles is um, 
depicted as a series of outbursts. And um, I'll just mention some of them now because uh, some are indeed uh, discussed in this whole uh, history program. So there was the 1381 revolution, which was the first in the world where people began really to demolish the uh, feudal system. There was 1549, which we're discussing this evening. Um, and then Charles, the history of trade uh, union. 1649, when Charles II got his head chopped off and the capitalist forces uh, first started to dominate and come to power. And there was the great uh, revolution, really, in 1688, which was the origin of a lot of our uh, rights uh, and progressive legislation. And then, of course, along came the first industrial revolution in the world, which gave birth um, to many working class political organisations, including the Chartists, which uh, argued for the universal suffrage, the vote for everyone uh, over the age of 18. And, um, of course, that also led to the consolidation and development of the trade union movement, which had its first great uh, convulsions, really, in the 1880s and 1890s, a time when, incidentally, the GFTU was formed. And then there was the other outburst which people uh, know about, apart from my dog over there, uh, which was the 1926 General Strike, which uh, goes down in popular history as a, a defeat. But actually, it was quite significant because 1926 was the year when the divide between rich and poor first began to significantly narrow. And then some would say that 1979 was another big uh, revolutionary moment when uh, the then uh, Thatcher government began to pull apart the post-war settlement and develop the neoliberal agenda with mass privatisation, huge attacks on the trade union movement, uh, and a, a theft of our public assets. And then some maybe would say that 2023 is another such uh, important outburst moment when everyone has been forced because of the uh, huge increase in profits uh, to uh, take strike action and other forms of action to uh, restore the value of wages. But these uh, outbursts, and there may be others that we could uh, all think of in our history, um, are not a sequence of um, unrelated events. They are uh, related in that um, in each moment of history where things have come to a sharp uh, confrontation, the memories and the lessons of the outbursts of the past have uh, come to mind and have been in people's consciousness. But also, I think it's worth uh, remembering a fantastic quote from the 1389-81 uh, revolts themselves, when um, uh, it was, I think, attributed to John Ball. He said that in, in time of peace, be not all men almost at war with them that be rich. The struggle for social change, the struggle for equality, has always been there. It's never gone away. Um, it's been a consistent uh, thing throughout our history, and I like to refer to it sometimes as the red thread that has always been there. Um, so when we look at 1549 and what uh, happened then, many, many people were inspired by the um, the revolutions of 1381, and they went back to a lot of their literature, uh, most notably a, a, a poem that people may have heard of by William Langland called Piers Plowman. Uh, and that was the same throughout our history, really. The um, progressive elements of, of, of the thoughts of struggle and the bravery and the episodes and the key figures have always been memorialized in poetry in song uh, and in popular theater 
And indeed, after this period, after the period of 1549, and uh, we have the development of uh, Shakespeare, who's regarded as our great national poet and playwright. But if we consider his work carefully, they're extremely progressive. They are, I would argue, about the decline and the demise of feudalism and the uh, problems and the dangers of the rise of capitalism. So um, I'm just stressing that there's been a continuity, a red thread. And uh, this first picture uh, that we can see here, which is a sort of photographic uh, re uh, creation of what it may have looked like when the thousands of people involved in the 1549 revolt took over uh, uh, Norwich Castle. This is done by um, a great uh, photographer called um, Red Saunders in a series called The Hidden Histories, where he, through these kind of images, has tried to record uh, what it may have looked like at these key moments in the past. And you can see his uh, series of uh, photographs like this uh, at various of various points in our history at the Cornbridge Hotel, which is the, um, the base of the GFTU. Uh, so, Gawain, if you could show us the next slide, please. Um, and I think it's the, the next one. Yeah, there we are. Here's a, here's a depiction of the of the leader that we're talking about of these uh, revolts in 1549, a man called Robert Kett. Now I'm showing this picture not necessarily because it's a particularly brilliant one, but it is uh, a sort of a stereotypical image of peasants in revolt with their pike staffs being led by a great uh, leader on horseback. Um, now, this this stereotype is not entirely true either of the 1381 rebellions and revolts or of 1549. Kett himself was a landowner, and um, he was very moved when he uh, saw uh, the people pulling down the hedges that the big landowners were putting around the common lands, which was in essence the start of the uh, uprising. And um, he's sort of depicted, oh, sorry, that's the, the next one. Yeah, he's depicted as, um, uh, you know, a, a leader pointing the way, which is also a bit of a stereotype because the distinctive thing about all the outbursts and the big moments of uh, revolutionary change in our history is that they have developed collective responsibility and ideas of democracy and people's engagement and um, that was very, very true of um, the uh, revolts in 1549, where the, the people would gather in their thousands for democratic debate in order to uh, focus their key demands and agree on their tactics in the struggle and agree, of what, uh, agree on what um, uh, changes they wanted uh, the government and uh, the ruling class to make. So you can have a, a, a look at the next um, image as well. If Gawain can move to the next one. So, it, uh, yeah, there we are. So here's a fairly uh, bloodthirsty image of, uh, of, of, of what was happening at the time. I think that probably is showing the, uh, the destruction of the leader, Ket. Uh, this was, uh, like all of the rebellions that took place, uh, probably really up until the 20th century, a very bloody affair that took place over the summer of 1549 with um, tens of thousands of people camping out in revolt, taking over Norwich Castle, uh, marching on the landowners' lands and so on, which was then um, brutally repressed in, in a pretty short period of, of time. And I'll come on to a bit about that later. And then the next picture, please, go away. This uh, is a, a, a somewhat of a glorified uh, image of um, the, uh, the, the 
oak tree, which was one of the locations where the uh, the armies of the people would meet to um, discuss uh, and formulate their demands. And I just put it up because um, uh, the, the, the tree <laughs> as a meeting place for popular revolt and democratic debate has been a very important um, thing in our history. So you, you can go back to the Tollpuddle martyrs um, who met under the, the tree in Tollpuddle to um, discuss how they would uh, fight for more wages, how they would form uh, their union and so on. Uh, you can go back to the Agricultural Workers Union itself, which was formed by Joseph Arch uh, under the tree in Warwickshire, and uh, of course Robin Hood um, in the uh, Sherwood Forest. And incidentally, the early ballads about Robin Hood uh, stealing from the rich and giving to the poor and so on, uh, the early ballads which go back into the 13th century they make it absolutely clear that Robin and his merry men were representative of the artisans and of the early working class who were fighting for social change. They weren't just uh, bloodthirsty robbers. Um, and here we have the image of Ket under his tree. Um, Gawain goes to next image. Here's the actual tree, which is still there in Windman in Nor uh, Norfolk. Uh, you can still uh, go up along the road there and stand under the tree and get your photograph taken, as I did recently with uh, one of Ket's uh, descendants, uh, uh, sort of great, 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 great grandson. So there it is. And that, that would have been the place where a lot of the democratic debate uh, uh, was, uh, took place. By one of the camps in uh, in the armies that they formed, and then the the next image, please go in. This is, um, in my view, one of the most important images in our history. And um, I'll um, I'll give you an interpretation because it's not um, a readily available, so you know, it doesn't readily tell you what it's it is. So this was um, the image that went on a front of a poem called um, uh, The Fable of Philagory. And this shows what the author, a guy called Robert Crowley, thought uh, was uh, uh, philagory. Now, philagory means a lover of silver. And what the image shows is obviously someone who's pretty well off uh, in their ermine robe, um, pushing money into a sack of money with a Bible. And this was a criticism, a part of the poem was a criticism that the reformers who had been seeking in those years to dispossess the Catholic Church and to seize power back to the country from the Church of Rome, i.e. the Protestant reformers, who historically were identified with taking the side of the people as opposed to the big landed aristocracy and the church, how they had become corrupted uh, into money grabbers and this guy is uh, pushing the money off into the sack from a thing called a bank and this is where the word bank originally comes from the money counting table now this poem was written shortly after the revolt and it was one of the most uh, dramatic accounts of what was happening to the country politically at that time and what this author recognized was that the the new establishment of the protestant reformers was uh, uh, developing a new class divided system of capitalist land ownership um, 
which was in effect as money grabbing as uh, the previous feudal system. And what he quotes at the bottom there is a significant phrase um, that kind of covers this whole period. It is taken from the Bible, uh, Timothy 6. And what it says there is the root of all mischief that ever did spring is careful covetous and greedy gathering. Now, what they meant by this would be what in modern socialist terms would be called expropriation, the accumulation of wealth that was commonly produced or commonly owned into private hands. Okay, so that's that's what they saw throughout this period as the the main problem with social development, if you like, that um, the new capitalists were stealing what belonged uh, to everyone and to the people for their own personal wealth and were using the guise and the guard of Protestant reform to cover it up and to do it. Now, this is important because what uh, the, the distinctive thing about that period, how capitalism accumulated its wealth after the expropriation of the wealth of the church in the monasteries and the, the big cathedrals and so on, uh, and distributing that wealth to the new Protestant divines and the new friends and uh, supporters of Henry VIII and so on, was a whole process which would then last for hundreds of years of expropriating the land and putting it into private hands uh, started to accelerate. And that is uh, what um, Marx and uh, all the historians, really, of the period have uh, described as the enclosures of the land. And what Marx said, and he does, he does great studies of... Uh, what happens in the 16th and 18th century to the, the common lands, what he said was the expropriation of the agricultural producer of the peasant from the soil is the basis of the whole process that is the origin of capitalism. So when we look at the uh, revolts in 1549, in essence, we're looking at uh, rebellions, revolts that started because of an intensification of the theft of common lands. And, you know, you know that our, our landscape in Britain is still very much shaped around hedgerows, which divide off the fields. Well, um, you know, that, that division of the fields was intensified in 1549 by putting up hedges around the lands that were once held in common. Um, the idea that things and everything should be held in common was, of course, a very uh, popular one and had a long um, history. And you find it uh, way back in the 1381 uh, period as well. And people had kept those ideas of things really needing to be kept in common very much alive ever since that period. And in fact, the, the word commonwealth, the commonwealth, was a word that was used by all social progressive people from probably the 13th, 14th century up until the 19th century and beyond. We still use it sometimes, of course, um, meaning that all of nature, all of the land, all of the products that people produce through working uh, on nature to make up things that they need and so on, um, should be held in common and probably it's time just to remember 
the fantastic quote from 1381, which um, concentrated and focused this idea. And it comes from John Ball, and I'm sure you all have heard it, but it's always worth repeating. And he said, when Adam delved, that is when Adam was digging the ground, and Eve span, who was then the gentleman? From the beginning, all men by nature were created alike, and our bondage or servitude came in by the unjust oppression of naughty men. For if God would have had any bondmen from the beginning, he would have appointed who should be bond and who free. And therefore I exhort you to consider that now is the time, that now the time is come, appointed to us by God, in which ye may, if ye will, cast off the yoke of bondage and recover liberty. So for hundreds of years, there was that uh, inspiring, motivating concept, which we still have, of course. We would probably call it socialism or equality. They would call it the freeing from the Norman yoke of bondage, the yoke that's, which people believed had been put on when uh, the Normans conquered the country and began the feudal system, um, the Commonwealth. Where the removal of the yoke of bondage, of class division, uh, believing that no um, no God, as it were, would have created a world where such divisions existed. So there was a long tradition in this red thread in British history of radical questioning of the political order. And it didn't just burst out sort of every one or two hundred years there was a lot a lot of uh, intense and violent activity 1381 which another one of these sessions will consider revolts in 1450 in 1485 in 1497 and then in germany 1525 the great peasant uh, revolts there which uh, obviously were known about here Revolts here again in 1536, and then this big one um, in 1549. Now, the guy who um, wrote the book about uh, the fable of Falagri, where we saw the image uh, a couple of minutes ago, Robert Crowley, he was uh, uh, in that long tradition. Some have called them the Commonwealth men. I don't think they were necessarily very well connected and organised in that sort of political party type of way, but there were they were of all of um, common mind over the generations and so on. He um, he was one who wrote a great deal about um, what had led to the revolts in fifteen forty nine, and he's got a fantastic quote, which I think um, is, is is worth reading out because he was one with uh, a number of the radical Protestants at the time, people like Hugh Latimer, who you may have heard of, and others, who were um, keeping the radical traditions that had been established before them alive, uh, and who were very, very, very much opposed to the new capitalist forces and the concentration, privatisation of Commonwealth, into fewer and fewer hands. So he said, if I should demand of the poor man of the country what thing he thinks to be the cause of sedition, I know his answer. He would tell me that the great farmers, the graziers, the rich butchers, the men of law, the merchants, the gentlemen, the knights, the lords, and I cannot tell who, men that have no name, because they are doers of all things that any gain hangs upon, men without conscience, men utterly devoid of God's fear, yea, men that live as though they were no, there were no God at all, men that would have all in their own hands, men that would leave nothing for others, men that would be alone on the earth, men that be never satisfied, cormorants, greedy gulls, Yea, men that would eat up men, women, and children are the causes of sedition. They take our houses over our heads 
They buy our lands out of our hands. They raise our rents. They levy great, yea, unreasonable fines. They enclose our commons. No custom, no law or statute can keep them from oppressing us in such short sort that we know not which way to turn as to live. Now, I guess that, that could have been written uh, about a number of things that have happened in our own lifetime, couldn't they? The, the theft of uh, our public services. And as um, the GFTU and uh, others were pointing out at the TUC uh, a couple of weeks ago, the current uh, intensification of the theft of our health service and putting so much of our health service into private hands. So we're not dealing with a completely unfamiliar set of circumstances in uh, today uh, as they were in 1549. We're dealing with, there are revolts and reactions to whether we call it privatization or whether we call it the theft, theft of uh, common resources. Um, obviously, there are sequences of events in history and um, what happened in the summer of 1549. Um, you can easily find on the website, so there are pretty good accounts up there uh, all of the time now. Uh, on, on the web, so there's a couple of great books about it by Julian Cornwall and Andy Wood. And I'm not going to go into the detail necessarily of what happened uh, during that year. Just um, suffice to say that... Um, the uh, in July, the the people started to first gather and object to the um, fencing off, the hedging up of the common lands, and uh, it was in Norfolk. And it's just a reminder to me that really the most progressive parts of the country for. Many many years, the, the parts of the country that led that, that that gave the great progressive leaders were Norfolk, Suffolk, Essex, the southeast of the country. It was in Essex that the 1381 rebellions began, and of course, it's that part of the country where there was very successful agriculture, as uh, concentrations of the uh, people uh, not dependent so much on um, peasant farming, but early workers and artisans and so on. Uh, that shifted, of course, with the Industrial Revolution. It went northwest with the creation of the factories and so on. But for many hundreds of years, it was that uh, southeast East Anglian part of the country that um, led to a lot of the progressive thinking. Um, the... Rebels formulated their demands, which I'll talk about in a minute, um, in July 1549, and they sent them off to the Duke of Somerset, who was in effect the protectorate, the protector of the realm, because the king at the time was Edward VI, who was a young boy. So the country was very much governed by the Duke of Somerset, who was uh, a very radical Protestant reformer. And uh, while he was radical and progressive in uh, many um, ideological ways, in terms of um, the defence of the enclosures or enclosure of the land, um, which was benefiting the new capitalist class and so on, uh, he wasn't so progressive. What in essence happened was um the the duke of northampton the marquis of north northampton was uh, sent out to defeat to crush to destroy the rebel armies that had formed in norfolk i think he he went out with 1400 uh, mercenaries and soldiers uh, but they were he was defeated he was defeated and um the rebels were able to take over uh, Norwich itself. Um, so very shortly after that, having been defeated, the 
the monarchy, the government of the day, decided that they would um, muster a very significant army, which um, in most of the reports seem to have been about 14,000 people with um, several thousand very quickly drafted in from Germany, Italy and Spain uh, mercenary soldiers to come in and defeat the, the rebel armies, which they did uh, in August. And um, at a, a famous battle, I think it was the 27th of August in Dusindale, a battlefield that is still there today, the rebel armies uh, were destroyed and Ket and his brothers and the other leaders were uh, taken away. And by December, they, I think they'd been hung at uh, uh, Norwich Castle, hung, drawn and quartered and so on as they used to do. So an army of the people was formed. An army of the people was crushed, as we saw many times in our history uh, before, but they ignited the spark of resistance and they ignited the sparks of key demands which would eventually be successful and which would um, destroy the feudal system and inspire future generations of socialists to uh, fight against the, the capitalist system. So um, let's have a look at the demands they made. They made 29 uh, demands in a document which is still in the uh, British Library. Um, and which in summary um, wanted not just a stop to the enclosure of the fields, the enclosure of the common lands and the theft of the common lands, but it went much further and much deeper. Um, so it said that they wanted to limit the power of the nobility. They wanted to prevent the overuse of communal resources. They wanted the values of the clergy to be remodeled, i.e. the clergy should not be shoving uh, loads of money into their money sacks with the Bible. Uh, they wanted that no lord of the manor should be able to exploit the common land. And importantly, they picked up the demand that the previous 1381 and other uh, revolts had made for the end of uh, serfdom and the end of bondage to the land and to the manor. So it was very extensive social transformation uh, that they wanted. And I'll just uh, I'll see if I can see a couple of them to read out to you uh, so that you get a sense of uh, how they expressed it and how really powerful uh, their demands were so um they just quickly looking down this i also note that one of their key demands was that no one should be profiting from the labor of others so all fishermen for example and all growers of uh, of food and everything and all freeholders should not have the profit of their labor taken by the Lord of the Manor and by others. Um, let me just see. Uh, yes. So the key demand which set it off was they shouldn't enclose the commons. We pray your grace that no Lord of no manor shall common upon the commons which is a good way of putting it. There should be no trespassing upon the people's land, no theft of the people's land. Um, we pray that all freeholders and copyholders may take the profits of all commons and theirs to common and the Lord's not to common to take profits of the same. So seeking quite simply to stop the profiteering from what belongs to the people and then in the key uh, demand 16 we pray that all bondmen may be made free for god made all free 
with his precious blood shedding. And that takes us right back, doesn't it, to that John Ball quote that uh, people were made and born equal and should not be divided by various um, social forms. Um, so that's a flavour of the demands that they, they made. They were significant and deep socially transformative demands, uh, which was seeking to um, not just curtail the powers of the, the ruling class, but also to overthrow the very basis 